Hello, let's talk about extraction of four impacted wisdom teeth. Now, remember the objective of these surgery videos is not to teach you how to do the surgery from scratch. If you haven't been in some program that gives you some very good hands-on training, don't try this at home because surgery, more than anything else, can get you and your patients into trouble. So the objective of these surgical videos is to enhance your surgical ability, assuming that you've already had some hands-on training. Now, what you should do before you extract uh, impacted wisdom teeth is first look at the radiographs of the teeth and plan the surgery before you begin the surgery. So you can see here's the upper left, lower left, lower right, upper right. Now one thing to think about with impacted wisdom teeth, there's a perfect time to extract an impacted wis wisdom tooth. You really don't want to extract a wisdom tooth when there's no root formation. You also don't want to extract a wisdom tooth if giving the ch given the choice when there's a complete root formation because the surgery is much more difficult. The reason you want some little bit of root formation is it keeps the tooth from spinning when you're trying to elevate it. So this is just about ideal, the ideal time to extract the wisdom teeth. So local anesthesia, a block, both sides, inferior nerve block, and then it's very important when you're extracting a tooth or you're doing endodontics or crown prep or something significant like that, sometimes even an occlusal filling if it's very deep, that you give an intraligamental. So I'm injecting into the mesial uh, intraligamental space of that wisdom tooth. I want it dead numb. Now most of the time these patients are gonna be sedated but you still want the tooth to be dead numb so the patient's not feeling anything. And remember, you're, not, you're usually not going to get profound anesthesia unless you give an intraligamental injection. And that's a 30-gauge needle with the bevel pointed toward the tooth you're anesthetizing and just moderate pressure for about 20 seconds. And you'll create a situation that the tooth is dead numb. Now many times I'll see new patients and they'll say their biggest fear of dentistry is not being completely anesthetized because they've had a bad experience with a dentist that didn't get the tooth completely numb. Well what I know is that dentist is not giving an intraligamental injection after the infiltration injection or the inferior alveolar nerve block. So give that intraligamental injection if you want that tooth to be completely dead numb. Long buckle. You'll see I was just injecting into this space and it will numb everything. So these are my initial incisions from the distal buckle aspect of the second molar back past the, just a little past the extent of the impacted wisdom tooth. This is a 15 Bard Parker blade and then you're gonna also incise from that point to the distal lingual of the second molar, and then you're gonna make an incision to the distal straight across of the second molar. Then I'm using, this is a periosteal elevator to elevate the periosteum so that this gives me space, and then I'm gonna create some space into which I can elevate the pieces of this too. So I'm, this is a uh, number four or six long shank round burr. You can use a high speed or you can use a motorized uh, drill. Now if you use a high speed, you've got to be sure not to elevate the lingual flap or you could get an air embolism, which means the tissue puffs up and it's crackly like uh, wrapping paper. So be sure you don't elevate that lingual flap. You remove this piece, but don't elevate the lingual flap. You can elevate the buccal flap. And then I'm gonna cut through the, uh, the occlusal surface to the furcation. Lots of water, very light touch around the distal, 
and now through from the occlusal to the frication. And I want to cut all the way through. So I've measured this ahead of time with my application on my uh, computer with the periapical radiograph. This is a Hugh Freedy E301, and I'm just elevating this piece into the space I've created distal to the tooth. Now, when I'm creating that space distal to the tooth, try to cut the tooth and not the bone if you can. You just want space. So you can actually cut the tooth on the distal and not the bone because you're losing the tooth anyway. I'm trying to elevate that piece. Now, I, I, what, I didn't cut all the way through the frication. So I went back and cut all the way through. Be careful not to cut past the frication in this case because you don't want to elevate. I mean, you don't want to damage the inferior alveolar nerve. I'm being sure to cut all the way through here comes that distal piece, then remove it with the rongiers, and then come back and elevate the mesial piece into the space created by removal of the distal half of the tooth. Be sure to protect the airway with a two by two gauze or your mirror. Now I'm removing the membrane, the follicular sac, with my rongiers. You don't want to curette that because the nerve, the inferior alveolar nerve, may be right there at the apical part of the socket. Just reach in with your rongiers and remove that follicular sac. Why do you remove the follicular sac? Well, if you left it, there's a, a distant possibility that a dentigerous cyst followed by an ameloblastoma could form. So you want to remove that follicular sac and irrigate the socket very well. Well, there it is. Now we're going to pack the socket. You can read the link, uh, look at the link, How to Never Get a Dry Socket. This is in the library of, uh, the video library of dentistrymasterclasses.com. So I've packed every lower wisdom tooth I've extracted in the last 40 years and knock on wood, I've never gotten a dry socket. Because remember, a dry socket occurs when part of the blood clot is lost from the extraction site. So by packing the socket with the resorbable gauze and the socket paste, it serves as a matrix for that blood clot so you don't lose it and you don't get a dry socket. If you get a dry socket, you get the dry socket within the first seven days of extraction because it takes seven days for the connective tissue lining to form in the socket. So that's, the, that's what we're trying to do, just get to seven days. So this stays in the socket for seven days, and after that, you really don't have to worry about a dry socket. You can irrigate the socket after seven days. You don't, have, you don't worry about a dry socket when you're extracting maxillary wisdom teeth. It's just the lower teeth. So always pack those sockets with resorbable cause, gauze and dry socket paste. See, I'm just packing it in there, going to serve as a matrix. Then I normally place two suture to pull the flaps together in the lower wisdom teeth. And this is 3-0 gut suture because you've got more of an incision here. And I place one suture to pull the flaps together. You can see this is the second suture to close that tight. Just one suture in the maxillary to close the flap in the maxillary wisdom teeth. 3 0 plain gut suture. So that suture was, will resolve in about a week. This is very important. I'm giving an intraligamental injection before I extract the maxillary wisdom tooth. So just like the bottom, always give the intraligamental and that tooth will be dead numb. The patient won't feel anything. And here's the wisdom tooth. I'm going to put an elevator right there and elevate it out. So a vertical incision, the distal buckle of the second molar, and then I'm reflecting all the way to bone. And then I'm going to place the periosteal elevator in that little space between the wisdom tooth and the second molar and elevate that. And then I'm going to put this E301 elevator in that space. And there it comes. Those are easy extractions. Be sure, see I'm protecting the airway with the two by two. You don't want that tooth 
to go into the airway and have the patient aspirate it. Now I'm going back and removing the follicular sac with my rongiers and then I'm placing one suture. Again, 3-0 gut, plain gut. Two suture, mandibular wisdom teeth. One suture, maxillary wisdom teeth. Now this is the lower right wisdom tooth. You can see I've given the, uh, the nerve block and now along with the long buckle and then I'm giving the intra ligamental injection to completely numb that lower right wisdom tooth. So this one I'll either be able to elevate it here if there's enough space on the distal of this tooth. You've got to have space to elevate the tooth into or elevate it straight out. That's probably not going to happen. I'm probably not going to be able to elevate it straight out without removing some tooth structure because it's impeded by the second molar. Now what about nerve damage? Sometimes just the kind of the shock of a tooth coming out of the socket can give a patient transient paresthesia. What that means is you haven't damaged the nerve, you've just given it a bit of a shock. And that paresthesia, the numbness of the lip or, and or the tongue should go away within six months. Normally it'll go away within a few weeks. Now on the other hand, if somebody were to actually damage the nerve, that can be a permanent paresthesia. So you don't want that. So I'm making the same incision here from the distal lingual of the second molar back to here and then from the distal buckle of the second molar back to here. So I have a little, and then I'm going to cut across the distal of the second molar and create this little triangle. And I want to remove that tissue so I have access to the impacted wisdom tooth. Here's across the distal. Just lift that piece right out with the periosteal elevator and then the rongiers. Scissors. Releasing the periosteum. Okay, so I've made this cut on the buckle and then the distal of the tooth and now I'm sectioning through to the furcation. And this is a surgical round burr, a number four or six. And this is a 301 elevator. And I'm just, see, I've created a space on the distal of that distal half of the tooth into which I can elevate that, that sectioned piece. These are my rongiers, just lifting that out. And then same thing on the mesial part. Once you've taken the distal half of the tooth out, it's pretty simple to remove the mesial half, you just elevate that into that space. Now, if it's a tight squeeze on the buckle, sometimes you have to cut that piece from mesial to distal into two parts because it binds on the, 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 buckle, the buckle and lingual wall of the socket. But normally it'll just elevate right out and see I'm protecting the airway with a two by two and go back and remove the follicular, follicular sac with my rongiers. Again, don't curette that with a curette because you don't want to take a chance on damaging the inferior alveolar nerve. In all these videos, we're going to skull drill. Skull drill is what my football coach called when you talked about the team you were going to play and the plays you were going to run and what you did and did not want to have happen. I'm going to try to guide you through so you don't make a really bad mistake. And the really bad mistake here would be if you damaged the inferior alveolar nerve. You don't want to do that, or the lingual nerve. So I'm packing this again with the resorbable gauze and the, the packing gel, the dry socket paste, and I'm going to place two suture with the 3-0 plain gut. And that will resorb in about, oh, five to seven days normally. They were suctioning that up real tight. And so the resorbable gauze, the blood clot, and the snug suturing will keep that blood clot in place for the seven days that it takes to get past the time that we worry about a dry socket losing part of the clot. We don't want to lose that clot for seven days. They sutured up nice and tight here. Now the maxillary right wisdom teeth again 
the infiltration on the facial and then the intraligamental uh, anesthesia into the, the periodontal ligament space to make sure that tooth is dead numb. So in this case, I'm gonna place an elevator right here and just elevate that tooth in that direction and it should come out in one piece. So a vertical incision off the distal buckle of that second molar tooth and then a horizontal incision across the length, the distal of the second molar, connecting to this vertical incision. Then I'm placing that periodontal elevator, periosteal elevator, into that space and it's the perfect width, it's rather thin, to put into that space and just get it going and then I'll usually come back with a 301, this is a 30E301, and here it comes. And see, we're again protecting, be sure you protect the airway with a two by two. You don't want that tooth popping out of there and the patient aspirating it. We're protecting it with the two by two and the aspirator, or you can put your finger in there. But that's another big mistake you don't want to make. And then removing it with the rongiers, going back and removing the follicular sac, remnants of the follicular sac, and then one suture is plenty for a maxillary wisdom tooth most of the time. Then have the patient bite down on two two by two squares on each side folded together and have them uh, just give nice tight pressure. What are the post-op instructions for these patients? Have them go home, they've been sedated, lay down with their head elevated because if they have any bleeding, you don't want it going back into the back of the mouth. Change the gauze about every 45 minutes. Now since we've sutured it tight, they really shouldn't have much bleeding. I don't want them to have any significant bleeding when they leave my office. Be sure you suture it nice and tight. Then they'll change the gauze probably two to three times and then have them get a glass of iced tea and just keep the ice and the tea in their mouth. It's not the drinking of the tea, it's the actual tea and the cold itself. Tea has tannic acid in it that's a good coagulant. So just put the tea in their mouth, have them put the tea in their mouth and just let it soak back there. Also, I don't know if this really works or not, but I've seen some good results with it. I'll have them go to the drugstore and get some aloe vera juice and keep that in the refrigerator and three or four times a day, put that aloe vera juice in their mouth and just let it soak, swish it very gently, and then they can either swallow it or spit that out. But that's very empirical. I don't know if that really works. It just seems like it has with some patients that have done that, some surgery cases. Have them close down firmly here. Then the patient returns in a week. Now what happens after seven days? The connective tissue lining has formed in the socket so you don't have to worry about a dry socket anymore. And at that point, you, you show them how to irrigate with a plastic scutan syringe, monojack syringe, and they fill this half with warm water and part with mouthwash. Go down the center of the teeth and drop it into the hole where the wisdom tooth was extracted and just very gently fill that hole up. You're not firing it in there. You just want to float any food debris to the surface and then have them spit it out and do one syringe on each side at bedtime and they continue that until the hole is completely closed. And that normally takes a week or two. Do that on both sides, only on the lower. You don't have to irrigate the upper because no food debris is getting in there because gravity is working for you on the upper the lower the only ones they have to irrigate. That's the dental minute. These techniques work and they work every time.